Part 1. Here a student called Joanna, telling her friend about an arts festival, which is being held in the city where they are studying. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 and 2. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 and 2. Hi, Joanna. Where have you been? Hi, Dave. I had to go into college to return a DVD I'd borrowed from the library. Oh, right. But while I was there, I got some information about the City Arts Festival that starts next week. Oh, yeah. I saw a poster advertising it somewhere. Yeah. And I picked up this leaflet from the library. It gives you the website address. So as I was there, I logged on to get more information. Actually, although they've got the full programme of events fixed now, you can't book online, which seems strange. There's a number to phone, though. Hmm. And are there student discounts? I guess so, but I didn't notice. Anyway, there are three things I'd like to see. An Italian film, a rock concert and an art exhibition. Oh. <laughs> the exhibition's free and you don't need to book, so I'll definitely go to that. But I'm going to get tickets for the film in case they sell out. Mm, good idea. You can always buy concert tickets at the door, because that's in a really big hall. Right. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to read questions 3 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 3 to 10. So, when does the festival actually start? Well, it's usually held the first week of October, but it's earlier this year for some reason. The opening night is September the 20th, and events go on till the end of the month. Hmm. And have you got that phone number? Yeah, it's here. Uh, look, it's 0967 990 776. OK, I'll write it down. 0967 990 776. Thanks. I thought the local council made a profit from the festival, but it says here that there's a commercial sponsor. It's a local bank. I didn't know that. Neither did I. What other events have they got on? Um, as well as the art exhibitions and stuff that's open every day, there are special events each day. Like on Monday, there's a musical in the City Hall. Uh. That's only £3.65 for students. Mm, I think I'll give that a miss. I've got football training on Mondays, but I'm free on Wednesday. There's a jazz band on then, and that's only £2.50 for students. Sounds good. Is that in the City Hall too? We could go. Well, I'm busy actually, but it's at the Sports Centre if you're interested. Oh, right. Thursday's the cheapest event, 
Only £1.25 for students. And it's on in the library. Can you guess what it is? <laughs> Probably the college choir. <laughs> Actually, no. They've not been asked, apparently. Oh. No, it's a poetry evening. Hmm. Isn't there any modern dance on anywhere? On Friday. That's at the college. It's quite expensive, though. £15 for adults and £12.75 for students. Oh, yes, that is a lot. If I'm going to spend that much, I'd prefer to go out on Saturday. Yeah, me too. But on Saturday night, there isn't live music or a party or anything. Just the fireworks in the city park. And that's only £1.50. Yeah, that'd be good. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 2. You are going to hear an interviewer who is interviewing Alan. He made a great discovery of Mungo National Park. First look at questions 11 to 15. As you listen to the first part of the interview, answer questions 11 to 15. An event occurred in 1996 over a period of three days that attracted considerable attention at the time and led to a new find in Mungo National Park, which is the focal point of the Willandra Lakes World Heritage Area in New South Wales, Australia. I talked to Alan Moore, the organizer of this trip, about his experience. Alan. What was the purpose of your trip? Well, as you know, I love the outback and lead tours of people wanting to go into more remote parts of the country. However, I thought it was time for me too to have a holiday. So I packed up my family and we went to Mungo National Park. Why did you choose this location? It holds a record of Aboriginal life stretching back over 40,000 years. And of course, I wanted my young kids to be amazed by the main feature of the park, the remarkable Walls of China, as they're called, where wind and water erosion have exposed this long history. I see. What was the weather like? It was unusual for that time of year. The rain was just one continual downpour after another. We were always soaked to the skin. So we decided to cut our holiday short and only stayed three days in the end. However, it was eventful. The obvious problem was to get back to the nearest town, a small place called Buranga. But the dirt roads out there are always impassable after rain, so we settled down for a long, wet wait in the park. We didn't really mind because the scenery was so interesting. However, the kids wandered away without our noticing, and eventually we realized they must be lost. So we used our two-way radio to contact the park rangers and the police, and a helicopter was sent. Luckily, the kids were found within a few hours, but they'd made an important discovery. Now look at questions 16 to 20. As the talk continues, answer questions 16 to 20. So, the trip was also eventful for another reason, wasn't it? Yes, yes. They led us to some ancient Aboriginal art. The kids had taken shelter in a very small, low cave that was difficult to see from the outside. We were lucky to have another family camping in our location. When they heard us calling the kids, they immediately helped us search for them, 
and as the hours went by, they also provided us with much-needed support and encouragement. We really appreciated their help, and as we were already soaked through after looking for the kids for a couple of hours, they even made sure we had enough dry clothes to wear. The park ranger managed to get through to us to lead the search, and when the helicopter pilot notified us by two-way radio that he'd seen the children but was unable to land nearby, we were able to eventually find them very excited about what was in their little cave. And what did you think of their cave? Well, after squeezing in, I must say I was impressed and managed to take a few photos of it before we left. There were many faint markings and dots on the wall. It was difficult to tell what they represented because they were so small, but people from the museum who have since visited there said the markings were similar to some other findings in the area and later confirmed they were very old. Although it's now a protected site, the children like to call it their cave and are allowed to visit it when a ranger can go with them. Thank you, Alan. If you go to Mungo National Park, you can see the entrance to the cave and some of Alan's photos at the ranger's station. Alan continues to lead tour groups in the outback, and if you want further information... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two undergraduates doing a research methods course. A girl called Leela and a boy called Jake having a seminar with their tutor. Now you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 24. So the task I gave you both was to choose an article about a small-scale research project. Yes. yes. You were then required to try to reproduce the research procedures in your own context, i.e. try it out for yourselves. Yeah, and that's what we've done. Great. So I'd like you to tell me a bit about the article and why you chose it. Well, the article's written by two university lecturers who had started using crosswords to help their students revise terminology for exams. And the crosswords were designed and set on computers. And we selected the article because, well, it seemed an accessible topic, even though we weren't familiar with the technique. You know, using IT to design crosswords for higher education. That's a good reason. So these lecturers wanted to see how well this innovation was received by their students. Yes. So how did you go about reproducing the research? Well, we drew up a list of terms from one of our own modules and designed a crossword for revising these terms. Then we asked our classmates to try out the crossword and give us feedback, you know, their opinions on how they felt about using the technique. Was it easy to find participants? It wasn't easy at first, but then we convinced them that by taking part in the research, they were actually benefiting themselves by preparing for an exam, which is coming up later this term. And it worked. Good. So how did you find out what the students thought about doing the crosswords? A questionnaire. The original article used a two-page long questionnaire. There were lots of excellent questions on it, but the whole section on difficulties using IT is now obsolete. Old-fashioned, even, even though it had only been written a couple of years ago. So you designed a shorter version? 
Yeah. Then we sent it to the 40 students by email and got 28 replies. I was taken aback by the fact that everybody we talked to thought this was a good return. I mean, the responses were well written. You know, people had taken a lot of care. But I was really disappointed with the low numbers. Yes, an important lesson to learn for an apprentice researcher. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. So what results did you get? Well, basically, the responses were extremely positive. The students said that doing the crossword on a computer helped them really focus on the work in hand and not be distracted, which is something that commonly happens with other ways of doing revision. Yeah, that was really clear. But something that struck me was that having fun hardly featured in their responses, nor did anything to do with spelling of hard words, which I thought would be an obvious benefit. No? Okay. Respondents also said that doing the crossword hadn't really increased their general motivation to study, but that it had highlighted the gaps in their memory so they knew what further work was necessary. Right. So how did your findings tally with those of the original researchers? There were lots of similarities, but... Uh... There were probably two main differences. We found that more males than females liked the technique, whereas the original study found the reverse. Also, our respondents said they wouldn't mind doing a crossword as a final official exam, whereas in the original study, students said they would hate doing it, even if it meant having a shorter test. But of course, both sets of respondents said they'd be interested in doing more crosswords for informal purposes, revision, and so forth. Right. So let's have a think about the whole project and what you've learned from doing it. Well, it was very time-consuming. <laughs> yeah, and I don't think we managed that aspect very well. <laughs> it could have been worse. I mean, we didn't have a lot of data, so we didn't have to spend ages processing it. And, of course, we'd already done a course on numerical data processing, so there wasn't much new there. Yeah, that's true. Anyway, I think we designed our questions well so that they gave us manageable data. Yeah, it really helped having the original study to guide us, as it were. And that helped us to see what a good research instrument is. What a good questionnaire should be like. Absolutely. We got a lot from that. But when we were writing up the project... I'm not sure whether we'll know how to acknowledge the work of the original study. You know, our referencing. No, that's something we'll both have to work on in the future. Actually, that part's been great. Finding ways to share and support another person. That's the real plus from the project. Learning ways to do that. Well, it's obviously been very successful. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You are going to hear the first part of a lecture on American culture and American customs. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Well, last week we talked about American education and today I'm going to discuss American values, characteristics, personal habits and courtesies. Keep in mind as you are listening to this lecture that your goal is to understand, not to emulate or judge. Just briefly, I'd like to mention that there is a remarkable ethnic diversity in the United States. The population of the USA is about 260 million. 73% of the American population is white. 12% is African American. 8% Hispanic. 3% Asian or Pacific Islanders and less than 1% American Indian or Eskimo. Many Americans resent generalizations being made about them because Americans see themselves as very unique and individualistic. On the other hand, Americans tend to lump foreigners together into one lot and condescendingly view foreigners as people who are not as intelligent or sensible as Americans. Despite Americans' dislike of generalizations, and their ethnocentric point of view, it becomes evident that they are indeed American. Americans value individualism, independence, informality, directness, punctuality, achievement and competition. Individualism is probably the most highly esteemed value in the American culture and an important key to understanding American behaviour. In the historical development of the country, Individuality was crucial for survival. If you asked Americans to characterise the ideal person, they would probably use adjectives such as autonomous, independent and self-reliant. Persons tend to be viewed as individuals rather than as representatives of a family or a group. Here are some examples of how this value affects behaviours. 1. If a group of friends go to a restaurant, Everyone wants to pay their own way. In other words, they want to have separate checks and not be someone's guest. 2. In friendships, which seem to initially develop more quickly in the US than in other cultures, the Americans may feel uncomfortable if you give them more help than they need. This is a tendency to draw back and see dependency as weakness. In some ways, the stress on the individual rather than the family or group has led to a more informal society. Sometimes this lack of formality is viewed by members of other cultures as a sign of lack of respect. But that is not the intention in the American value system. This informality is even more predominant on the university campus than in other segments of society. Some ways in which you might see this value expressed in behaviours are 1. You will generally be on a first-name basis with other students, in spite of any age differences. 2. Dress is very informal on campus. 3. Language is informal and sometimes confusing. Phrases like, see you later and drop by any time are not meant literally. They are informal ways of saying goodbye. Americans are direct. Honesty and frankness are more important to Americans than saving face. They may bring up impolite conversation topics which you may find embarrassing, too controversial or even offensive. Americans are quick to get to the point and do not spend much time on formal social amenities. This directness encourages Americans to talk over disagreements and to try to patch up misunderstandings themselves rather than ask a third party to mediate disputes. It is particularly interesting to see what behaviours have culturally become associated with straightforwardness. 1. A firm handshake somehow has come to be interpreted as a sign of sincerity. 2. Looking at a person when you speak to him or her gives an indication of honesty. 3. In a question of honesty versus politeness, honesty wins. It is considered better to refuse graciously than to accept an invitation and not go. 4. 
you will be taken at your word. If you refuse food the first time it is offered, to be polite, it may not be offered again. An American will not know that your initial refusal is politeness. Great value is attached to time in the U.S. Punctuality is considered an important attribute. As with all values, there are different rules of acceptability in different cultures. In the U.S., you should be present for school or business appointments at the exact time agreed upon. In social appointments, you can arrive 10 to 15 minutes after the agreed upon time without giving offence. If you are invited somewhere for dinner and are more than 15 minutes late, you will need to offer an apology and an explanation. A phone call explaining you have been detained and will be late will save face for you and patience for the other person. Americans also value achievement and competition. The American style of friendly joking or banter, of getting the last word in, and the quick and witty reply are subtle forms of competition. Although such behaviour is natural to Americans, you may find it overbearing or disagreeable. Americans are obsessed with records of achievement in sports, and sports awards are often displayed in their homes. Also, sometimes books and movies are judged not so much on quality, but on how many copies are sold, or on how many dollars of profit are realised. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Mm -hmm.